I'm delighted to be here and a little intimidated by being the first speaker of the first panel, but I hope that you'll bear with me and that we can begin to answer some of the questions that Patrick raised. And the first question I want to tackle is the question of Europe as a secular society, because conventional wisdom holds that Europe is thoroughly secularized, secularized, disinterested in religious values, and liberated from moral guidance or from cultural backwardness, um, depending on your perspective, provided by organized religion. And Europeans often tell the story about themselves with pride, about their post-religious autonomy from superstitions of religion. And many Americans regard Europe as a cautionary tale about godless civilizations. And those extremes are both, I think, um, inaccurate for different reasons. But regardless of their accuracy, for Mormons living in Europe, it can be uh, this sense of, of secularism can, be, can pose challenges, particularly social challenges. Sometimes a sense of being regarded as intellectually immature for subscribing to religious beliefs. Sometimes a sense of being socially ostracized for not participating in social rituals, often involving alcohol consumption. But despite the apparent secularism of European society, I think there is common ground to be found, and that may rest on redefining our concept of religion itself and the concept of what secularism is, which, once we do that, opens up some intriguing possibilities for cooperation and bridge building and may reduce the sense of being alienated and isolated that a lot of Mormons in Europe feel. So over the next few minutes, I want to sketch out the history of the Mormon experience in Denmark. Um, Denmark is often considered the most secular country anywhere, if you look at sort of rankings of secularism. And um, the church members there, the membership is, is fairly small and has stayed fairly small for more than a century. But if you look at the tr historical trajectory, which I try to sketch out in my title here, um, we can see both the kinds of ways that the experience has changed and some of the ways that there may be opportunities uh, new opportunities for engaging with the world for Mormons and other self-identified believers in a post-religious society. So I want to start by going back to June 1850, which was when the first Mormon missionaries arrived in Denmark. It was almost exactly a year after the passage of the 1849 June Constitution in Denmark, which established religious freedom. This is a, the front page. It's a lovely document. Um, but putting something on paper doesn't make it true. And so even though religious freedom was granted officially by the Constitution, the society that the missionaries encountered was one in which religious identity was intricately and intimately intertwined with national and cultural identity. My recent book was mentioned, Danish but not Lutheran. And I spent a lot of time in that book documenting the ways Danish society engaged with the concept of being something that was not Lutheran and still being Danish. Um, but one of the things I mentioned there is that Lutheran identity, Lutheran religion was so intimately involved in Danish identity prior to 1849 that confirmation into Lutheran church was a prerequisite for citizenship, employment, marriage, and full fellowship in the ethno-national community. So if you weren't Lutheran, you were nothing. You really, there were, they were non-Lutherans, but they were not citizens. There was a small pockets of Jews and um, Catholics, but they were not given the rights of citizenship. So as a result, the introduction of religious difference in the 1850s, um, which takes really tangible form when tens of thousands of people convert to the LDS church over the next 50 to 70 years, caused considerable commotion in Denmark. Um, it was something that was not possible before, and people didn't know how to react. Um, this is a painting by Christian Deesco from 1856. He was a very, very noted highbrow painter um, trying to come to terms with this phenomenon of people coming into homes of ordinary Danes and telling them remarkable, sometimes outrageous things about the possibilities of leaving the Lutheran church and becoming something else entirely. There were street riots. There were uh, George Parker Dykes was chased out of town on a rail, had to sneak through the police office onto a boat to get out of uh, the city of Olibor. There was physical persecution. Meetings were disrupted. Um, Danes always find this really shocking. Um, they're so sensible and they're so calm that they would have these riots over religion um, seems in inexplicable to them. One newspaper account of a disrupted LDS worship service in the town of Roskilde demonstrated, uh, attributed the mob's behavior to an explicit, and this is a quote, explicit expression of their desire to demonstrate loyalty to the inherited faith of our fathers in a violent way, close quote. So the newspaper understood that they weren't necessarily acting out against Mormons as such, they were acting out against 
the, the shift in the status quo, this change in what was possible. And less physical opposition to Mormons um, and the Mormon disruption of Danish homogeneity manifested itself, and again, I document this on my book, so I won't go through it now too much, but as social ostracization and public shaming in the form of all kinds of media forms, penny ballads, newspaper broadsides, uh, let's see if I can get this to move forward for me here. Oh, there we go. Um, this one, the Mormon girl's lament on the right tells a story of a rich young Mormon girl, uh, Danish girl who succumbs to the lure of the missionaries, gives them all her money, goes to Utah, is married as the 12th wife to some old man, um, is miserable and comes home to Denmark, or they think she wants, longs to come home to Denmark. In other ballads, they come home to Denmark and say, I'm never leaving again. Um, so reinforcing sort of that breaking the norm is a bad idea. This one here is a, a profile of Brigham Young that appeared in the Illustrated Magazine in uh, 1854 to sort of account for who these, these people are. There's also um, a really amazing 1911 uh, cabaret, um, including the song called Mormons, Mormons, that talks about how, um, you know, <laughs> there's a great song, um, you know, on Sunday in his uh, parlor, Jensen and his wife are having a party and there's all this wife swapping planned, but we don't need Mormons to do that, we can do that ourselves, um, is kind of the message of the song. And then the very first ever anti-Mormon film was made in Denmark in 1911, starring a man named Valdemar Silander. You can see him in the top right. He was sort of equivalent of Tom Cruise or Brad Pitt, by far the highest paid actor in the Danish film industry, which was one of the leading film industries in the world at this period. And so um, this fell into a pattern of white slave trade films in which the Mormon missionary Andrew Larson becomes a surrogate for other white slavers that lure women, unsuspecting women, uh, into sex, sex slavery of various kinds and have to be rescued by their boyfriends and fathers who come to Utah with absolutely no difficulty and find them immediately. Um, so at this, you can get a sense of, of the sort of the, the, the social disruption that was caused by the, the conversions to Mormonism, but um, it wasn't because they believed in God. That wasn't the problem, that they identified as Christian or um, any of those things that today are some of the problems that Mormons face. It was because of theological differences. Um, as I mentioned, the Danish Lutheran Church was a fundamental part of the fabric of society, and everybody belonged to the Lutheran Church. By birth, you were baptized into it. And that actually only stopped about 20 years ago, um, that you were automatically enrolled in the Danish Lutheran Church. And so this choosing to become a Mormon meant embracing unfamiliar dogmas, embracing a sense of chosenness. It's not really surprising that a lot of the people who joined the church were day laborers and tenant farmers who had a lot less to lose by breaking with the status quo than other people. And then in many cases by the decision to immigrate to Utah. Uh, the Danish establishment's objections to Mormonism were primarily rooted in its difference from the Lutheran status quo in matters both practical and theological. And that ranged from the practice of polygamy um, to the belief in ongoing divine revelation. As early as mid-1850, the bishop, the, uh, bishop Ipe Münster, who was the primate of the Danish Lutheran Church, argued that lay preachers, like the Mormon missionaries, were unqualified to teach Christian doctrine or administer the legal formalities of church administration. So speaking from the perspective of a man who runs the state church, he doesn't want to open the door for just anybody to practice, uh, to preach, which is a problem they had had earlier in the century with a, a very vibrant pietist movement um, involving a lot of lay preachers. Other critics focused on the financial danger posed by the exodus of members from a tax-supported state church. According to Mormon studies historian William Mulder, quote, the priests could see dwindling ties, emptier pews, and a breakup of a snug and time-honored village order in which their estate had been secure. It was an economic threat, and for those genuinely interested in the cure of souls, a still more spiritual one. And one of the people that was genuinely interested and concerned by the spiritual danger posed by Mormon doctrine was a man named Peter Christian Kierkegaard. He was a Danish Lutheran pastor and the older brother of the philosopher Søren Kierkegaard. And in contrast to the run of the mill sort of scandal mongering that made up much of the anti-Mormon material you saw in the press, a lot of it was borrowed directly from American and Anglo sources, Kierkegaard's response to Mormonism offers an example of the kind of sincere theological differences that separated 19th century Mormons from their Danish Lutheran counterparts. Kierkegaard took issue with uniquely Mormon doctrines introduced by the missionaries, everything from Christ's alleged visit to the American continent after his resurrection, to the belief that Native Americans are descended from a Semitic tribe that inhabited the Americas more than 500 years before Christ. When invited to speak at a cottage meeting the missionaries held with some of his parishioners in the village of Pilesbo in August 1854, 
uh, so they invite this man who was known as the Dispu Disputing Devil of the North. Um, that was the title he got in grad school. Um, they, missionaries encounter him and say, hey, you should come to our cottage meeting and talk. And so he comes and he speaks. And he, I, didn't, I don't obviously have a recording of his speech, but the printed version of his speech runs to 50 printed pages. So he must have spoken for quite a while. But in that speech, he refuted the Mormon teachings by testifying to his belief in the correctness of the Christian gospel as preached in the Danish Lutheran church. He promised not to speak of anything that the missionaries hadn't addressed themselves. He was very respectful and didn't repeat any rumors or anything. He just addressed the doctrinal differences and expressed his, particularly his skepticism about an idea, the idea that Christ would not have been able to ensure the survival of the church he founded. And he argued that the Mormon claims of an apostasy and restoration destroy our faith in Christ. His colleague, the pastor Wilhelm Birkedale, shared the opinion that believing in a large-scale Christian apostasy was equivalent, and this is a quote, to spitting in our Lord's face by making him, as the Mormons do, a gambler who has overplayed his hand and must lock his doors because he can no longer redeem his own promise, which states that the gates of hell shall never prevail over his church. So it's, it's a great quote, but it also shows, I think, a really sincere concern that the theological deviation from the norm that the Mormons represented was an existential threat to the Christians in Denmark. Both Birkedale and Kierkegaard were highly religious men, deeply devout, invested personally and professionally in the Danish Lutheran church. And so they regarded people who converted to Mormonism as sadly misguided. The 19th century Danish Mormons responded to these kind of critiques in various ways. Approximately 23,500 Danes converted to Mormonism between 1850 and 1920, and about a third of those became disaffected and left the church. But the majority of them who remained affiliated eventually immigrated to Utah. The, and C.C.A. Christensen, the famous painter, um, was one of those uh, men who left. The choice wasn't simply between leaving the church and, or leaving Denmark, though. A third option that presented itself seems to have been to go on the offensive and try to change Denmark. Danish Mormons often chose to speak out about their new beliefs, holding the cottage meeting I mentioned before, to share them with their neighbors. They petitioned the parliament and the king on several occasions for protection of their constitu constitutional rights. They proselyted enthusiastically, and many of the new converts spent time as missionaries in Denmark, either prior to their immigration or after having spent some time in Utah and coming back uh, to their home country. And from various first-hand accounts, it appears that these were very energetic, but very, very untrained missionaries who were very, very zealous in their condemnation of the spiritual state of their countrymen's souls. They preached a lot about damnation. Um, and the, particularly the doctrine that if you didn't convert and immigrate, you would miss the Im imminent arrival of Jesus Christ um, and you would be burned. So it didn't make them a lot of friends, but it did contribute to changing Danish society, though not necessarily in the way they expected. What we get in the, the wake of religious freedom is that Freedom, uh, so religion is decoupled from the state, decoupled from national identity, and becomes an increasingly private matter for Danes. And the more religion becomes a matter of personal preference, the less central role it played in Danish society, in inverse relationship to the rise of the Danish welfare state, which is characterized by its universality. And if you no longer base the universality on a religious homogeneity, you have to find other grounds for that universality. And so the Mormons are the first wave, I will, if you will, in the diversification of Danish religious identity that expands to include um, many other groups, Baptists, Jehovah's Witnesses, Methodists, and, and others. And as religious difference becomes more common, the requisite universality emerges from the decreasing visibility of religion in public life. It elides those differences and makes it possible to have a basis for a state that calls itself homogenous. And the shift from an absolute monarchy to a parliamentary democracy demarcated in the constitution had dramatically decreased the role of the Danish monarch. And if you look back to 1660, when the Danish absolutism was instituted, they were Lutherans because the king was Lutheran. The religion of the king was the religion of the state. And as he is no longer the father of the state, his religion is no longer definitive for his people. And the constitution justifies the existence of the Danish Lutheran state church, which still exists to this day, it's still part of the state. Um, but justifies it by the fact that the majority of the Danes belong to it. So if at any point the majority no longer belongs to it, they're gonna have a constitutional crisis on their hands. But by the time the Danish welfare state um, really comes into its own in the 1920s and 30s under Prime Minister Torvald Stowning, religion, like the monarchy, had been reduced to little more than a symbol of Danish heritage, not a part of an integral part of everyday life. And this tendency has continued ever since. 
that nearly 80% of the Danish public are still enrolled as members of the Danish state church, but fewer than 2% attend services on a regular basis. And this kind of evidence is frequently used to justify the description of Denmark as highly secular. But the process of secularization and the privatization of religion is often identified as a threat to organized religion, not just a fact of life in Denmark. It's considered um, the reason why the number of converts, for example, to the Mormon church has decreased so dramatically in the past 150 years. If you look at the 23,500 people that were converted in that 70 year period and compare it to the fact that the Danish church, um, the members of the church in Denmark has held steady at about 5,000 for the past century, even as the population of Denmark has grown from 2.3 million in 1900 to 5.3 million in 2000. So there's 3 million more potential members and we haven't gotten any of them. Um, they're all, it's really a very uh, static number. And so it's hard to know why it's stagnated, but a lot of people point to secularism as that, um, as that cause. For example, in a 1999 essay, The Impact of Secularization on the Proselytism in Europe, which is included in a volume on global Mormonism, BYU law professor W. Cole Durham argues for the culpability of secularism. He says, in a secularized setting, intense religiosity that becomes the central focus of life tends to be thought of as something dated or fanatical. The phenomenon of conversion is often regarded as an anomaly to be explained by brainwashing. The assumption is that something as irrational as conversion, especially to a small unknown religious group, could only be explained by some psychic distortion. Durham Paris's critique of the pseudoscientific skepticism of religious experience with an assessment of how the intensive privacy protections in place in many European societies lead people to, share, to regard efforts to share religious beliefs as aggressive, impolite, and wrongfully intruding on, on privacy, which paternalistic policies attempt to protect consumers from in the same way that consumers are protected from other forms of consumer fraud. So he says, you know, we're just trying to share what we believe, and they say, you're invading my privacy. This is not something we talk about in public. And the Danish state has not instituted policies against proselyting by Mormon missionaries, but anyone who's been a Mormon missionary in Denmark, as I was, can attest to the anecdotal truth of Durham's observations about the Danish public's skepticism about religiosity, as well as their sense of having their privacy invaded when you try to talk to them on the street or in their homes. And many Danish Latter-day Saints that I've spoken to, especially teenagers, confirm the ex existence of strong social prejudices against intense involvement in any religious community and suspicion of any expressed belief in an anthropomorphic god. And this can be a really alienating experience for da Danish Mormons who find themselves relegated by the mere fact of their religiosity to the ma main margins of mainstream Danish society. But it also opens the door for unexpected existential alliances with Danish Lutherans who share conventional religious faith. The denominational religious squabbles of Peter Christian Kierkegaard's day are no longer meaningful. And those few Danes who openly avow religious belief, and there are some, there are actually quite strong religious communities in Denmark, um, often find that their shared status as outsiders and social outliers bind them to, binds them together more closely than any theological differences may divide them. Moreover, as satisfying as it may seem to blame the relatively slow growth of the LDS church in Denmark in the past century on secularism, the correlation between the two is difficult to prove. As political scientists Anthony Gill and Eric Lunds go to note, scholars have often posited a relatively simple unilinear relationship between modernization and religious decline, but this thesis is often based on casual observation rather than empirical evidence. Swedish religious scholars Kjell Leon and Marcus Agnefors caution those who would declare religion dead in Europe by saying that perception can be deceptive. It is saying it is well known that Americans have a tendency to exaggerate their religiosity, while Europeans tend to understate theirs. So maybe it's a matter of how we tell the story. So part of the problem is terminological, a kind of religious language barrier, if you will, since religiosity or the lack thereof is often characterized by propositional beliefs and including certain types of behavior. And if you don't do those things or ascribe to those beliefs, then they call, you'll be called secular. But it all depends on what terms you use to define religious and secular. In her 2009 dissertation, Ina Rosane, the Swedish sociologist of religion, postulates, based on her extensive field research, that the concept of religion needs to be resubstantiated in order to more accurately describe how Europeans, in her speci study specifically Danes, understand it today with regard to five distinct beliefs, uh, aspects, belief, routinized religion, religion as heritage, practice, and tradition. And she asserts that the processes in contemporary society known as privatization are conducive to segregating belief from religion. 
Belief is relegated to the inner minds of individuals, whereas the process of privatization ensures that religion is entrenched in institutions and denominations in a pluralized market. As a result, looking for religion in public spaces will yield an impression of secularism and irreligiosity. So she conducted focus groups with people just drawn at random from the Danish population and discovered that three quarters of them described themselves as believers, even though none of them went to church. And she attributes this phenomenon to a misdefinition of the concept, the term religion. And she says that packaged religion has been replaced by what she calls unpacked religion. So religion as a packaged concept belongs to a vision of society where various aspects of human life have been packaged together into a relatively close-knit idea with a bureaucracy and institutional structure, which due to certain social and historical contingencies have fused and attained considerable impact on larger society. So if we cling to this definition of religion, she says, we, we see a lack of it, we see a, a decline. But if you look at the unpacked definition of religion as beliefs that have integrated themselves into society, we find that it's no longer quite so clear cut. And so rather than measuring religiosity based on statistics about who comes to church or the number of converts to a particular ideology, she advocates for a much more nuanced view about religion as a part of an individual's life in the form of belief, tradition, heritage, or practice in dynamic interplay in their mind and their social context. So in closing, I just wanna say that this gap between organized religion and individual belief is central to the experience of, Den of Mormons in a post-religious Denmark. Durham even concedes that religion may not be entirely absent from European societies. He notes that new forms of secularized religiosity, um, such as the commitment to human rights and environmental values, coupled with internalized spirituality, have largely supplanted older forms of religious involvement. But Leon and Agnifors contend that that's exactly what makes Scandinavia religious. Um, they, they talk about Zuckerman, Phil Zuckerman is a sociologist who wrote a book, Society Without God, where the least religious nations can tell us about contentment. And he says that Christian faith in Scandinavia is more a cultural than a religious phenomenon. But Leon and Agnifor say that's exactly the point. Scandinavia really is Christian, provided we do not reduce culture to some kind of useless surplus we can cart around. Religion in Scandinavia is also a cultural phenomenon, and that is precisely why Scandinavia is not secular. It is true that the Swedes and the Danes belong, and a quite a large majority of them, to the Lutheran folk churches, and that this belonging is not necessarily linked to any belief system. It's definitely more about belonging to than believing in specific Lutheran doctrines. But Scandinavian culture and its history are intimately connected with religion, and Scandinavia has a strong Lutheran ethos. Such an ethos involves both a certain mentality and politics, and societal norms and values expressed through various institutions. So they connect the whole theory of the welfare state with Luther's doctrine of vocation and the biblical idea that all humans are created equal, which create the conditions for the Scandinavian society's emphasis on social welfare and on egalitarianism. They credit the Protestant work ethic with the economic prosperity of Scandinavia, which Zuckerman attributes to secularism. So as members of the Danish cultural community, Danish Mormons share these common attitudes with their countrymen, regardless of religious denomination. The privatization of theological belief systems has rendered irrelevant the denominational divides that made 19th century Danish Mormons stand out as unusual, leaving behind the cultural values of equality and hard work shared by Danes in general. And I believe by recognizing the importance of these values, these parts of unpacked religion that permeate life in Scandinavia, Danish Mormons will be better able to forge existential alliances with their neighbors and work toward accomplishing common goals for the betterment of society and the salvation of all of God's children. Thanks. <laughs>